The original Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle was a tremendous, fresh experience for me. The strategic gameplay was unlike anything I'd ever played before. The music was extremely catchy and enjoyable, and the vibes were immaculate. It came to be my second favourite Switch game. If you want to see the rest of my top 5, go ahead and click on this card in the corner. I've played many hours of its versus mode, I've replayed the entire main campaign at least 5 times, I've 100% completed it once, and I regularly listen to the game's soundtrack. Like, seriously, like, pretty much every day I listen to some of the game's soundtrack. Naturally, I had high expectations for the sequel to such a terrific game. Did Sparks of Hope live up to those expectations? <coughs> Let's get into it. Sparks of Hope is a game that fundamentally functions very differently to Kingdom Battle. Outside of battle, the worlds are far more focused on exploration as opposed to being mostly simple straight lines with the occasional puzzle or collectible. There are now far more NPCs than the first game, giving us a lot more fun dialogue and interactions than we had before, where we mostly just had Beepo comment on various goings on without many people to actually have conversations with. Mostly tied to these plentiful NPCs are this game's side quests which can reward you with planet coins, sparks, and sometimes even access to more of the planet to explore upon completion. The designs of said NPCs in this game, from wardens to townspeople to bosses, are all much less Mario-y in their designs than in the first game, and the same goes for the worlds themselves too, make of that what you will. But the various worlds are still fairly diverse and enjoyable to explore. The best one being Pallet Prime by such a large margin it's not even close. I freaking love autumn themed areas so much! And the worst one being Terra Flora by also quite a large margin. After you've completed the main story there, it's a nightmare to get around between all the little planetoids, making completing the side quests a huge pain. Honestly, that area is what made me give up on 100%ing this game. And what a missed opportunity to have a cover of the Gusty Garden Galaxy theme. Or even at least reference Gusty Garden in any way at all. Hi there, off script George here. Um, I think that might have been a little bit harsh. I don't think that it's actually like a, uh, a cover of Gusty Garden, but I would say that the the Wiggler on the on the train, uh, the, the, that battle theme, it's it, it gives me very Gusty gu Gusty very Gusty Garden vibes at least, honestly. So that might that might have been a bit of a harsh criticism because the wiggle, the Wiggler and the on the Wiggler train fight. Very Gusty Garden vibes. Also, of course, I'm glad he was referenced in some way, but seeing Phantom in Beer's backstory got me really excited for him to possibly make an appearance, only for him not to. And while on the topic of Kingdom Battle characters I wanted to see return, I fully expected Wario and Waluigi to make an appearance in some capacity. I suppose they still got a chance in the DLC. We'll see. The other planets are middling to good. Beacon Beach feels very average, but I like Augie and I like the vibes of his temple. Pristine Peaks has great snowy vibes. I'm also very fond of the mansion vibes. An overall solid world with a wholesome father-daughter relationship between Captain Orion and Rabid Rosalina. There's also the final area of the game, Curse's Domain, which is of course very short and ends up feeling kinda pointless. When I saw that we were launching off to the Comet Observatory, I got excited at the prospect of exploring a corrupted, evil version of the iconic spaceship. Perhaps meet up with Polari or Lubber, or both. Or perhaps have a final battle with the Spark Hunters. There's so much they could have done with the Comet Observatory as an actual explorable area in the game, especially since the Mario parts of this Mario and Rabbids crossover are far less pronounced here than in KB. But alas. Then we finally have Barrendale Mesa. Yeah, I know I'm not listing these in order, deal with it. At first, I was really vibing with the place. An aesthetically pleasing wasteland with all sorts of machinery scattered about. And the music actually gave me Celeste vibes, which of course is a very good thing. But Barrendale was the point in the game where something that had been bugging me the whole time really started to get on my nerves. Silence. Fun fact about me, when I reach a point in a game that doesn't have any music, I instantly don't feel like playing anymore. 
For me, constant background music is what allows me to feel engaged in the experience of play. It helps me think when there is a puzzle to be done or a battle to be fought, and it's as important as the game's visuals when setting the scene and vibe for an area or activity. Honestly, there is nothing that makes me want to put the game down and stop playing faster than the music cutting out. Silence almost completely ruins any enjoyment I was having. And Sparks of Hope has so many segments that are completely without music! I hate it so much! Why? Generally, in Sparks of Hope, the silences are found inside sub-areas, and intermittently in the main areas before the main environment ruining problem has been solved. I think that for the latter, the intermittent silence is to greater exaggerate the improvement and liveliness of the planets once you stop the storm, make the trees colourful again, etc. But that effect could be much better achieved with some quiet moody tunes, which often these areas have. It just randomly and frequently decides to peace out. Why? It's even worse when there's sub-areas with no music throughout, like in Terra Flora where it further cements its spot as the worst planet by having two lengthy sub-areas with absolutely no music. Terra Flora sucks so much, I bet if it were real, it would give me hay fever. The music itself in Sparks of Hope isn't bad, although in my honest opinion I think that the music in Kingdom Battle was much better. Kingdom Battle's music was catchier, grander sounding, had recognisable recurring motifs, and most importantly, it never abandoned me like Sparks of Hope music frequently did. Kingdom Battle's music is like a good parent that's always there for you, while Sparks of Hope music feels like a deadbeat dad you only see on weekends. At least the music is always present during battles, and said battle music is often very good even though I'd say it's less impactful and memorable than Kingdom Battles. But perhaps that's an unfair comparison since I've only played SOH once and KB many times. In conclusion on the topic of music, the frequent silence in this game bothers me a lot and it's honestly one of my two biggest gripes with the game, the second of which I'll talk about later. But for now, let's discuss the characters and story a bit. I've briefly mentioned the Wardens already and I must say that I rather like them a lot. Augie is lovable in a pathetic man-child kind of way, Captain Orion is, as I said earlier, a great dad figure for Rabid Rosalina, though I wish we saw more of them together, and he spouts lots of delightful sailor gibberish. Poor, poor Woodrow causes calamities every time he reads a poem, and I still wonder how he came to be the Warden. Mama is very charming, and the only Warden who really feels like she earned her status by teaching the local Rabid community to be better, more responsible mechanics. And then we have frickin' Bea Bezos over here who overworks all her employees and generally annoys me by putting excessive amounts of Z's in her words. All the Wardens have a series of portraits portraying bits of their history, all drawn in different styles of 2D artwork, and they all look fantastic and lively and come with some fun backstory from Beepo. It probably didn't help my opinion of Bea that she's the only Warden in the game where you learn about her past first and then meet her second, because she has an interesting past which her present day self doesn't really live up to, unlike all the others who we meet first and then come to know and appreciate them more through knowing their stories. Another group of characters in this game is the Spark Hunters, Curse's minions. I love me a good Mario RPG bad guy group, but while I do like these guys, I can't help but feel they were very underutilised. The gold standard for Mario RPG bad guy groups is definitely Count Black's minions from Super Paper Mario, because you get to know them through their many interactions with each other and multiple encounters with the player. But throughout the whole game, you get to see each Spark Hunter a grand total of two times, and one of those times is a brief cutscene with no dialogue. The least of what I expected from them was a big boss fight against all three of them at once, giving them all a good climactic confrontation with Edge, which honestly would have been a way more interesting way for her to come clean about her origin than the Darkness Edge. Heck, maybe we could even see some dialogue from Bedrock? I like each of their designs and personalities, especially Daphne, she has some great lines, but alas, they were underused. At least they have a decent chance to appear somewhere in the DLC or the next game in the series. I hope they don't meet the fate of the Buario crew. Lastly, and most importantly on the topic of the game's characters, is of course the heroes. Look at this guy. This Chad. This man amongst men. 
He is powerful to be sure, as we'll get into soon. But this man's swagger and charisma is unmatched, his bravery undeniable, and his ability to build a snow sculpture more than 20 times his size in a matter of moments is so impressive that the mighty snow golem himself fears him so much he had to throw him in the freezer or he wouldn't have had even the slightest chance of victory. I just think he's neat. In this game, the developers decided to give all the main rabbits their own unique voices and quite a bit of their own dialogue as well. If you ask me, this was an excellent decision that finally, truly sets the rabbits apart from minions, confirming them as much less annoying than minions and far more than simply the video game version of the insufferable yellow Tic Tacs. They all feel so vibrant and unique now, and they all have little lines and mannerisms they demonstrate in battles that make them all super endearing in their own ways. Except for Rabbit Luigi, he's cringe now. I do believe Peach gets a few little bits of dialogue after the start of the game, but sadly I don't think that Bowser got any past his introduction, which is a huge shame and something I was worried about going into this game, as Bowser has been historically hilarious in the Mario RPGs. In fact, he's my favourite character from them. Rabbit Rosalina is a huge mood, Rabbit Peach continues to be a great marketable series mascot, Mario is using Starlord's blasters to practice for his upcoming role in a Chris Pratt biopic, and Luigi's Death Stare continues to be canonised in games, but he also gets to do a cute little dance. Edge is, as I expected by her design and name, edgy, though I honestly really like her. She does look like someone's rabid deviantart OC whose colour scheme was inspired by monster energy drink, but I really like her story, and it's a really nice moment when we hear her backstory and why she's called Edge, and all the other heroes accept her one by one. It's such a wholesome, every time moment. Though it would have been more powerful if it had followed a final emotional confrontation with the Spark Hunters, like I said earlier, perhaps even still including Darkness Edge. Finally, I would be amiss if I didn't talk about Beepo and Genie. It's really interesting to see full voice acting in a Mario game. This being the second time it's really even been partially attempted since Sunshine. The voice actors do a tremendous job with our AI pals in this game, wonderfully capturing Beepo's sass and Genie's journey to understanding emotions. I really like the Genie subplot of her learning to feel, it's wholesome. Okay, with all that said, I'm positively ravenous to talk about the gameplay in Sparks of Hope, so let's get into it. Allow me to introduce you to the ultimate life form. Don't let his small stature fool you. He's capable of decimating great crowds of enemies with barely a drop of sweat on his brow. The mechanics of the battle system in Sparks of Hope is vastly different to how it was in the Kingdom Battle. Are these changes for the better? <laughs> The four main differences from the first game are Optional enemy encounters Most of the game's fights can be avoided if you want as opposed to the first game's set amount of mandatory fights. This allows the new EXP and leveling system to actually matter. Movement is very different, being both more and less restricted in different ways. You can now move as much as you want as many times as you want within your available radius, but you can no longer use your weapon before moving. Attacks now lock you in place. Can you imagine if they allowed one of the characters to just ignore this rule though? Man, that character sure would be overpowered, huh? Of course, they wouldn't do that. It'd break the game's balance and make it that anyone who doesn't use that character is straight up playing it wrong. Thirdly, each character has only two actions they can perform in a turn excluding movement. As opposed to in the previous game, cooldowns permitting, each character could use each of the three types of actions once per turn. This change reminds me of the action tickets from the versus mode of Kingdom Battle, which is ironic because they didn't bring versus mode back for this game. And that is non-ironically the second of the two major things that bug me about that game. But let's just move on and treat versus mode as a mere afterthought. After all, that's how the developers saw it. It's not like versus mode was my favourite part of the game, and I was excited for the sequel to finally give it respect by updating it with characters as the DLC comes out and providing an online mode for it. Ha! Ha ha ha! Ha 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 ha! No, I'm not salty. I don't even care about the stupid versus mode. 
It's not like it's my favorite game to play with my best friend who lives far away and I was excited to finally be able to play it with him long distance. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> and finally, instead of purchasing different weapons with fun designs and amusing descriptions and names that deal more damage and give different super effects, we have this game's titular Sparks. I'd say that the Sparks are probably the biggest of these mechanical changes, and are the factor that makes strategizing and playing this game feel truly different from the first one. Different weapon skins are still available in Sparks of Hope, but they're purely cosmetic. On the surface level of charm and whimsy, I like Kingdom Battles weapons more than Sparks of Hope's weapon skins and sparks, but on the more practical gameplay side, the wonderful strategic diversity offered by the sequel's sparks and items make for a more fun experience if you ask me. In Kingdom Battle, getting new weapons for your party was kind of a chore. Every few battles you had to go into the menus and spend your limited coins on main and sub weapons. And because of this limited coin pool, you can't really keep buying two weapons for all your teammates every time, meaning players naturally are not usually very eager to experiment with different characters, especially later on in the game when the required investment to make them viable rises. Poor Yoshi. In Sparks of Hope, getting new sparks doesn't cost money, and each spark you collect as the game progresses continues to have value even as you get new ones. Unlike how there's no reason to go back to your now weak old weapons you already spent non-refundable money on in the previous game, this game encourages players to mix and match sparks with the different characters, and equip the best ones for the job before each battle. You can even use some of the sparks to give the characters their old abilities back. Um, excuse me. Can you be quiet for a minute? I'm trying to... Okay, I get it. Your magnet dance is even more overpowered now. Please allow me to switch from a general review for a minute to discuss my own personal experience with this game. Rabbit Mario is clearly the most powerful character in this game. In the previous one, it was debatable. Honestly, the character's versatility was more balanced. But in this game, while a lot of the cast are honestly a bit mid, none come even close to reaching the damage potential of this absolute beast. He's a close-range specialist, but he's also the only character who can move after attacking, meaning he never has to be in harm's way. With the help of Magnet Dance and Starburst, five hits from his dukes could eviscerate the entire population of Luxembourg if he wanted, but he still has to be fairly close to the enemy in order to attack. That's a fairly sizable downgrade to using him, right? Well, Rabbit Mario is the ultimate spear, but when paired with Peach, the ultimate shield, they are unstoppable. In my experience with the game, upon reaching the side quest where the game forces you to only use Peach and Rabbit Mario, I then proceeded to make my way through the entire rest of the game without ever swapping them out. Mostly. They're just too good together. Especially in the normal non-story battles where the battlefield isn't very big, these two can safely wipe out huge hordes of enemies with ease. And the cooldown of Peach's barriers isn't even a problem if you buy stopwatches. The third character on my team would change fairly often depending on the kinds of fight I was in or how I was feeling. But honestly, with Peach and Rabbit Mario, most of the game's fights just became cakewalks. I didn't even need a third character. Anyway, after a while of getting used to them, I came to accept and rather enjoy this game's mechanics and differences from the first game. At first, certain things like not being able to move after attacking and having limited airtime in a team jump were very frustrating and caused a lot of blunders on my part. But by the time I reached pristine, but by the time I reached pristine peaks, I'd. But by the time I reached, <laughs> by the time I reached pristine, pissed in peaks. <laughs> no, but by the time I reached pristine peaks, I'd adapted to the new ways. Of course, what with my team throughout the game not having very much variety, I didn't get much use out of most of them. And I'd very much like to replay the game someday soonish, while forcing myself to use a wider mix of characters, and not just sticking to Peach and Rabbit Mario. But just to cover my bases, Mario is his usual jack of all trades self. He has a good damage output, his hero sight is very helpful, and his dual blasters are certainly a valuable asset to the team. But I hardly used him in this game, mostly I think because I was so tired of being forced to use him 24-7 in the first game. Rabbit Peach was one of my more often used characters, a heal of course being very useful. With my choices of third teammates to accompany Peach and Rabbit Mario, I would often select a support based character like RP, because RM can handle damage duty mostly solo and Peach is busy with barrier duty. 
Every now and then, RP can heal the team when needed, and the rest of the time she can focus on cleaning up the enemies Rabbid Mario is nearby. Luigi being a long range specialist, I got good use out of mostly on large boss battlefields and the like. Aside from those occasions, I didn't really have much use for him. Nice dance moves though. Rabbit Luigi seems to have a lot of potential to be a great asset to the team, even though his weapons are no longer passively fueled by the most overpowered super effects. And his once incredible vamp dash is no longer his own ability, and it's definitely a better idea to equip the required spark to someone else with more dashes. His weakened ability, called Disabled now I think, can now be used to also lower enemy defense, and can even be applied via dash. Not to mention the insane number of opponents he can hit with a single attack from a long distance. So, why did I hardly ever use him in my playthrough? Because he's cringe, that's why. Rabbit Luigi was a perfect candidate for experimentation with sparks, different strategies, and skill tree builds. But I didn't do any of that because I didn't like the vibes of this version of him. His personality just screams annoying, obnoxious kid who thinks he's awesome and cool, and he makes me wince every time he opens his mouth. I would really like to get past this, and actually get some good use out of the guy. Perhaps I will on my next playthrough, we'll see. Edge is another character I wanted to use more. I did use her a decent amount though, I actually like her vibe and attitude. She's decent in battle, and has some promising upgrades to her skill tree. She's got some very useful dash related upgrades, so I'd really like to do some experiments with the dash super effects on her. Rabbit Rosalina is... a vibe! Then lastly we have Bowser. Okay, but seriously, she is such a vibe. Look at the way she runs, she can't be bothered to do any of this, and she never fails to make me laugh. Rabbit Rosalina was one of my more often used third party members to join the unstoppable duo of Rabbit Mario and Peach. But still, I feel like I didn't get as much use out of her as I would have liked. Say it with me now! I oh, want to use use her, her plush Luma gun is one of the game's best weapons, and her ability, Stasis, which is for all intents and purposes just a reskin of Rabbit Cranky's long story, is extremely useful. She was a frequent pick for my third party member like Rabbit Peach or Edge, but like I said before, Peach and Rabbit Mario is such a powerful duo that poor RR was still barely used outside of bosses or the occasional large battlefield that RM struggled with. It is certainly useful having the ability to pause bosses or especially problematic enemies until you can deal with them, or just to stall time so your abilities can recharge or to kill time on battles where you just need to survive. And lastly we have Mr. Bowsman himself, my biggest disappointment in this roster. I really wanted to make good use of him, I really did, but his strengths and abilities were just not useful at all. His main weapon I think has a decent amount of range, and it does do a bit of area of effect damage, but said area is rather small even fully upgraded. His biggest strength seems to be the ridiculous damage output of his critical hits, but unlike some other characters you can't upgrade his crit chance, only his crit damage. And I can't be bothered to have a third of my battle strategy be just cross my fingers and hope for the best. Then there's the damn Mecha Coopers. I hate them. Somehow they actually made sentries, one of the best things in the previous game, actually bad. Not only do they look extremely cursed, but they're expert time wasters. Every time you use them, you've got to wait for what feels like forever for each one to move individually, which takes more than twice as long if they actually reach enemies and you have them upgraded with burn. They don't even do much damage, and they often get destroyed by the enemy before they reach their targets. Every time I use them, every turn they move, I let out a large sigh as I settle down to watch the world's most boring cutscene. I always have the enemies, and therefore the Mecha Coopers, turn set to fast forward. And even then, I grimace at the waiting time. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if other players figured out some ways to make the Koopa King viable. He has some potential, and for all I know the Mecha Coopers could actually be really good, I just don't like using them. But I really cannot be bothered. It's such a shame that I don't like using him in this game, because most of the time when Mario RPGs let you play as Bowsman, he's extremely fun and makes the player feel like a mighty beast. Speaking of mighty beasts, this game doesn't really have many bosses. There's the three Spark Hunters, the mostly optional extra large enemies, a Wiggler, Goop McGee's over here, and of course Cursor itself. Only four of these are actual unique boss characters. 
and a little side tangent about the Cursor Fight. The Cursor Fight is very fun and interesting and I like how it's every single character split up across three battlefields. But in the final phase, the, 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 the boss HP doesn't go down when you manage to fill up Rosalina's like big attacks. And like, I know that if you pay attention you can see that Cursor is on fire, like progressively more on fire when you manage to get hits in on Cursor. But when I was playing through that boss, I didn't, I thought that my game had glitched. I thought my game had glitched and Cursor was not losing HP and th I'd done something wrong or the game had glitched and I'd wasted loads of time in this difficult boss fight. <laughs> Why doesn't the HP go down? With the exception of Cursor's Domain, which is barely its own world anyway, in terms of conventional boss fights, each world has only one of them each not counting optional ones. And even then I think calling Wiggler a conventional boss fight is a stretch. This is a bit of a shame after I so enjoyed all of the frequent, fun and unique bosses in KB, but this game makes up for it with a lot of unique, important story battles that aren't necessarily boss fights, but are tough enough to feel like they are. Do I like Calavera from KB more than these blizzard belching boulder faces? Yeah! Calavera is an excellent design and makes me wonder if he's in control of all these spike finds we see that overran the town and perhaps he's what caused the residents to abandon their homes. But these stone faces make for a tougher, less cheesable fight. Beating them actually makes a huge positive difference on the world, and they actually get way more canon lore than Calavera sadly ever did. I like lore. And Sparks of Hope has it in buckets, whereas KB has it in thimbles by comparison. In short, this game's idea to have these big not-boss battles that make the world prettier once you win was a great one. I miss the proper bosses, but they're not completely gone, and these have fun and unique gimmicks and make me feel extra motivated to win just to see the planet back at its best self. And doing that also turns the music on in the outside of battle world, therefore allowing me to actually enjoy playing the game. Yes, I truly hate playing in silence that much. So, with all that said, with all these different aspects critiqued and dissected, all my major complaints and praises put together in a half-decent scripted video, what do I think of SOH overall? Did it live up to its predecessor? What I'd like to do is a rundown of the various aspects of these two games, and score them both out of 5 for each. Since I doubt I'll ever bother doing a proper one in the future, consider this also as a semi-review of Kingdom Battle 2. Is it really fair to score this game by directly measuring it against its predecessor? Firstly, we have the visuals of the games. The world design, colours, animation, all that jazz. Kingdom Battle went for a very cartoony, distinct Mario-esque approach to its world design and whatnot, the various locations feeling very at home in a Mario game, but with a hefty dose of rabid zaniness added in. Unlike KB, SOH opted for more realistic looking environments, both in terms of aesthetic and in terms of layout, now being freely explorable instead of linear paths from point A to point B. The visual vibes in SOH feel more like real life locations with rabbit zaniness on top, rather than Mario World with crazy rabbit seasoning. And people's preference here may vary, but aside from the standout palette prime, I enjoy the looks of every KB world more than all the ones in SOH. KB is just more interesting to look at to me, especially since the worlds of Kingdom Battle can have the environment change many times within a world, giving way more uniqueness than SOH which adheres to more realistically uniform planet designs. But I'm not ignorant of the technical improvement SOH has on KB, and its worlds can still look extremely appealing. Even... Ugh, Terraflora. It does look really colourful and vibrant and nice once you fix the geyser. Ugh, praising that place felt wrong. I give KB 4 out of 5 stars and SOH 3 out of 5 stars for visuals. Music goes hand in hand with the visuals when creating vibes in a game, and as I've already discussed at length in this video, SOH really drops the ball in the music department. Not because the music is bad, a lot of it is rather good, even though I'd say the majority of it doesn't come close to KB's music quality and consistency, but because the music is not even present far, 
far too often. And to me, music being present while I play games is so integral to my enjoyment of the experience, and even my ability to play them. Fun fact, if I get the gamer stage in Smash Bros, I just SD three times and throw the match. I refuse to play that game in silence. It is too uncomfortable. At the highest of SOH's musical highlights, which is Baron Dale Mace's stellar music, it can in fact compete with KB's best stuff, but so much of the game's musical talent was sadly wasted. Why bother having three stupendous composers, and then have 60% of the game take place in dead silence? It boggles my mind. Anyway, I'm done ranting about this. SOH gets two stars for its barely present soundtrack, and KB gets a perfect five. Yeah, I'm salty. Overworld gameplay, the stuff to be done in the games outside of battle. Gotta say, Sparks of Hope actually wins this pretty easily. KB was still enjoyable outside of battle, but there wasn't much to do besides look at the nice scenery and solve the occasional puzzle, which were often optional. But SOH has myriads of missions, NPCs, optional quests, etc. Of course, exploration is now much more fun, since the worlds are no longer linear. SOH doesn't get a perfect score here because occasionally navigation is a pain. <coughs> Terraflora. <coughs> and I know this is a different category, but different aspects of games affect each other, and the frequent lack of music does hit my enjoyment of this part of the game hard. Kingdom Battle gets two stars, and Sparks of Hope gets four. Story and characters. It's very clear that Kingdom Battle's story was much more basic than SOH's, and there are way, way fewer characters in Kingdom Battle than in Sparks of Hope. I do like KB's story of Bowser Jr. using Spawny to make an army to try and please his dad. I don't have any problems with it, even though there is far less to it than SOH's offerings. And although SOH's greater complexity brings with it a few problems I have with it, like the underutilized Spark Hunters and the lackluster Final World, I have to admit, there's so much more to appreciate in Sparks than in Kingdom. The main heroes having dialogue and depth, myriad of colourful and likeable NPCs that actually service the plot, and the villains are good in the sadly few appearances they have. I may have some problems with the game as a whole, but they clearly turned up the charm and intrigue in this game. Two stars to Kingdom Battle's minimalist plot and cast, and four stars to Sparks of Hope's rich and diverse ensemble. The battle gameplay of these two is hard to compare. They're both very different and yet similar. They both do some things better than the other and some things worse. The action ticket approach of SOH is more restrictive and having to activate sparks to get the super effects instead of having them be a passive part of your weapons means you need to strategize even more with even more limited resources. But I kinda like that. The game is fundamentally tougher than its predecessor, not counting the couple of characters who can cheese almost anything. Also, are the resources in SOH really more limited? I wasn't even thinking about items, they do add a lot more strategy, I love using them to get extra actions and healing options are always welcome. I don't feel strongly about the grid system versus the radius system, I think they're both pretty much just as good. Sparks are less tedious than KB's weapons outside of battle, but more tedious inside it. You know what, I think it's cop out time. They both get 4 stars. I might give them different scores if I played SOH through again, since... I've experienced it way less than KB, but for now, I'd say my feelings on both of these games' combat systems are pretty much equal. Sorry, I know that's frustratingly anticlimactic. I'll probably make another video about this game once all the DLC's out. And the final category before the end of the video is... My, my chair is bumping into my desk. Multiplayer! I'm not fond of KB's co-op content. I played it a couple times and it didn't sit right with me. Annoyingly, that mode got plenty of updates and new content that I didn't care about, whereas my beloved versus mode never got so much as a single bug fix, which it needed. Rabid Luigi's Vamp Dash doesn't even work. Though I adore the versus mode and think it's extremely fun, it did lack online multiplayer and like I said, sadly remained unupdated throughout the game's life. Got a dock points for that. Kingdom Battle gets three stars for its multiplayer content. Sparks of Hope gets zero stars. You know, because it has no multiplayer. Is it really fair to even make multiplayer a category in this comparative review when Kingdom Battle has it and Sparks doesn't? So, in the end, Kingdom Battle wins with 20 out of a possible 30, and Sparks falls behind with 17. Whoa. That's only a difference of three points. That result 
genuinely surprises me. As I thought through my scores on various aspects as I wrote this script, only now adding my conclusions up. If I didn't count the multiplayer factor, this would just be a tie. I honestly thought SOH would fare worse in my scoring. It turns out that despite some hefty problems I have with the game, there really is a lot of great innovation to be seen here that pretty much balances out the negatives. Just think, if it had multiplayer, and if its music were ever present, it would absolutely beat Kingdom Battle for me. This is legitimately not how I expected this review to end. I thought I'd get to the conclusion and say something along the lines of, despite some great ideas, SOH ultimately falters in the finer details. But what I'm actually going to say is... Sparks of Hope is a game that makes great strides to improve on its predecessor, which it does in several areas. There are, however, a few areas that mean a lot to me where it flounders quite a bit. I can see a lot of people not being too put off by things like the far too common silence or the lack of multiplayer, but these were honestly Kingdom Battle's greatest strengths in my opinion. And in the case of multiplayer, there was a lot of room to improve to make it truly excellent, which Sparks unfortunately didn't see as a priority. These quibbles aside, Sparks of Hope is a game that continues to showcase the strength of this production team and the quality of this series. It's left me mostly excited to replay it someday, and I look forward to playing the DLC. I suppose I should probably play at least one Rayman game to prepare. I wouldn't say it's quite as good as its predecessor, but it comes damn close. Thank you, Davide. If you give the game a toggle that can make the music stay on at all times, I'll bump up the music score by a couple of stars. No, I won't give it the full five. The music's not that good.